Hey everyone, welcome to the Acrobatic Arts Podcast. I'm Loren, and I will be interviewing some of the top leaders and innovators from the dance and acrobatic industry. If you are a teacher, performer, student, or a lifelong learner like myself, you are sure to find these episodes intriguing and full of inspiration. Acrobatic Arts is passionate about providing current and relevant information for everyone. So please, sit back and enjoy as we share our passion with you and the world. Today we have a truly special guest who knows how to light up the stage with her dazzling moves. She's not just any dancer, she's a rockette. And we happen to share a unique connection. We both grew up dancing at the same studio. So with a proper five, six, seven, eight, please join me in welcoming the fabulous Karen Ritchie. Thank you, Loren. It is such an honor to be here with you today. Karen, as this is your first time on the show, and for those listeners who may not know you as well as I do, could you share a bit about your background and how you first got involved in dance and acro? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you know, I have two older sisters. And from the very beginning, my mom was taking me along as they were going to class, uh, whether it was at the gym or at the dance studio. And so from a very young age, my mom asked if I could be placed into class with my next eldest sister. And that way she wasn't driving as much back and forth to the studio. I was always in class with older students and I loved it. It pushed me to be a little bit better, to try a little bit harder. I wanted to keep up with everyone. And I loved getting to do that with my, with my sisters. It was such a family thing for us to be going to dance or going to gymnastics. And we did it every single day. So as you know, I was very involved with gymnastics when I was younger. I think I was training up to 24 hours a week. And that was when I was quite little, like nine, 10, 11. Um, At a pretty young age, we were very committed to gymnastics. And on top of that, I would go to dance class and I was probably doing at least two classes in each discipline as well. So two ballet, two tap, two jazz. And so I don't remember my childhood outside of going to school and then getting picked up from school and going, being driven either to the dance school or to the gym. And it was just like the best part of my day. I loved everything about it. And I didn't know anything different than, you know, going with my sisters to class. So to me, that is how I think of my childhood. I grew up in uh, a relatively small city in Canada. And we didn't have, I personally didn't have the desire to spend a lot of time outside in the cold. So I was in the studio or in a gym, you know, up to 30 hours a week outside of school. That is fascinating. And very true. How did your passion for dance and acro evolve over the years? Well, as you can imagine, I think at a certain point when you're doing that type of activity at that level, there comes a point where you need to focus on one thing. And I distinctly remember I was in the car going to gym after school or something. And I remember thinking that I wasn't as committed as I should be, I was starting to get a little frightened by some of the bigger skills that I was being asked to do. And that's such a big thing for someone at that age at 11, 12, 13 years old to realize about themselves. But I was also really excited because I had started getting this passion for dance and specifically ballet. And I knew that like I could free up some of my time if I gave up the gymnastics and just focused on dance. So there was a point in my kind of like adolescent years, I guess, if you want to call it like preteen, where I realized I needed to focus and I chose dance. And from that point on, I spent as much time as I could in the dance school. I got private lessons every Friday. I was um, actually, I got out of class a little bit from school and I would go get a private lesson at the studio um, because that was really what I loved doing and what I wanted to focus on. But also that being said, I didn't completely leave my gymnastics or acro when I pursued dance. I always had acrobatic elements in my routines. 
And this is a little bit before that became the norm, sort of what we see today in any discipline, you might see some acro skills. But back then, that was a little bit, a little bit less common. And I was always happy to add those elements to my routines. And even my sister and I, we would do, you know, silly things in the, in the house. I'm sure my mom got gray hairs every day because of us. We would practice flipping off countertops and doing lifts over top of the coffee table. So one day our dance teacher saw this little routine we had put together and she ended up choreographing it into our duet. So the acrobatic side of me and my sister, our relationship kind of followed us just into the studio anyway. Um, But yeah, to be completely honest, it was like a very clear moment to me when I remember thinking, I will devote all my time to dance from now on. And now let's dive in to your time with the Rockettes. I believe that at some stage in their lives, every aspiring dancer dreams of becoming a Rockette. I was no exception, but my dream was short-lived when I discovered the minimum height requirement. I am just on the shorter side of the spectrum, so I, you know, gave up that dream quite quickly, but I'm so interested and I'm such a fan still of the Rockettes and I want to know what it took to become a Rockette. So can you walk us through the audition process for the Rockettes and what it was like? Absolutely. And, you know, Loren, you might find this kind of interesting. I actually auditioned to be a Rockette because it was someone from our studio who had gotten the job I didn't even think it was possible and I realized that if someone I grew up training with could do this job and be selected for it then perhaps I had that same possibility or potential and so it was because of someone we grew up with that I actually sought out auditioning for the Rockettes now that being said I was not um very up to speed with what I was doing so I went to the open call. There's generally two open calls. One takes place in the spring around April and one in August. And at the time, the Christmas Spectacular had two different sort of production uh, lines you could go down. There was the New York one, and there was one that took place in outside cities across the United States. So I went to the audition uh, for the New York call in April, knowing very little about what the job entailed. And I was so naive. In fact, I didn't even bring tap shoes. (laughs) I got to the audition and and there, you know, every year there can be upwards of 500, 700, nearly a thousand people auditioning to get this coveted position. And they line you up around the block at Radio City Music Hall and you get brought up into the large rehearsal hall to do your audition. So I went upstairs and they start off, you learn a combination. You'll perform that combination in groups of three generally in front of the panel. And then if you are selected, you will move on to the next combination, which is usually tap. Thankfully, I had met a friend in line who let me borrow her tap shoes. And uh, I got to make it through the top portion, but I was not asked to stay afterwards at that New York call. So unfortunately, that didn't work out the first time for me. However, I did return the second time in August, which was the audition for the traveling show. And it's the same experience, the same number of applicants are there. You do the same three at a time, jazz combo, tap combo, tick combo. And luckily for me, I made it through the entire audition. And at the end, they tell you, we're going to take your measurements, we're going to get all your info. And if a spot becomes available, we will get in touch and they send you on your way. So that was exciting. I was really excited about it, but I still had a few days left in New York. So I decided I would go back the next day and do the ensemble audition. So in the Christmas Spectacular, we have the Rockettes performing on stage. And then there are other performers in the ensemble, male and female, who dance just as hard. They have such an incredible show. The talent is impeccable. It's just perhaps, you know, if the height uh, requirement isn't met, you can audition for the ensemble and still get to be a part of the show. So I thought, hey, why not try that? And... I went to the call and I made it through the first combo and they said, does anyone do point? And so those of us who said yes, went to go change our shoes and the director came and found me and she asked what I was doing there. And I thought, (laughs) wow, I'm very surprised this woman knows who I am 
And okay, so I explained I was in town. I had a few extra days. I thought I would do the audition, you know, get the dance class out of it. And she said, that's very nice. And I don't want you to be insulted, but I'm going to ask you to leave. And she said, I have decided I'm going to offer you a position as a rocket. So I, I got to find out a little bit earlier or sooner than other people that I was going to be offered a job. Karen, that sounds intense, but it sounds like you were just eating it up and enjoying it, which is wonderful to hear. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced during your time as a Rockette and how did you overcome them? The biggest challenge, which is also one of the best things, is that you never get to spend your holidays at home with your family, right? You're always working over Thanksgiving, Christmas, sometimes New Year's, and all of those events that your family um, would celebrate together, you're not able to be there. And that can be really hard. There are big life moments that happen that you have to decide whether or not you can be okay with yourself if you say, I can't be there. Things like uh, births, if someone you know really close to you, if you have a niece or a nephew who's being born or your best friend is having a baby, we don't get time off during the season. So we work six days a week, we get our one day off, but oftentimes on that day off, there's extra work. So if you're performing in the parade or you have a special event, those rehearsals often take place on your quote unquote day off. Mm -hmm. So you can go four, five, six weeks with zero days off. That takes a, a toll and it's a big sacrifice that you have to make away from your family and your outside life during the holiday season. So, you know, while some of these sacrifices have to be made and you make that choice, there's also some really amazing things that come out of the job too. You meet some of the most incredible people, both on and off the stage, who become your family, your chosen family. Uh, in fact, I met my husband at work. So, you know, it's just, it's not a traditional life, but it is a really incredible experience to be a part of. Aside from the performances, what other aspects of being a Rockette do you think are important for people to understand? I think people see the Rockettes and they think, wow, that's so cool. How do they stay, you know, so together? No one ever makes a mistake. Oh, my goodness. If you make a mistake, you'd be fired. And that's that's a lot of pressure. So there's a really big mental aspect that goes with this job that people might not consider. Because it's already, it's very challenging physically. Uh, you have to be at the top of your field in tap jazz, ballet, all of the dancing. But you also have this incredible expectation of perfection that comes at you internally from yourself. It uh, comes at you from the front of the room, from the people creating the show. And also, you know, it comes at you from the public as well. So it's a lot to deal with. And then you have to understand as well with that pressure you're putting on yourself, you're trying to be as perfect as you can be, right? It's precision. You're thinking like excellence. And then you might not consider how hard it is because while you might be doing everything that has been taught to the T, if the people around you are doing it just a little bit differently and they're doing it all the same, you are actually the one who is wrong, mm -hmm. even when you're right. <laughs> So you have to kind of get this idea out of your head that it's perfection that you're after because it's not, it's unison. Um, and so that, that mind game, that whole like pressure and, and importance of being perfect. Yes, you have that, but then it's also this whole other thing about matching the people next to you and doing it differently one year than the next, even though it's the same choreography. I never thought of it that way, but I can see how that would even bring you closer together as a family and as a team. So that is a really good point. Now, I've seen a few pictures on your social with you and some other amazing people. Could you share some memorable moments performing or the famous individuals that you've had the opportunity to meet during your time with the Rockets? Oh, my goodness. We have been given some amazing and incredible opportunities. One that sticks out to me, it's been a number of years, but back in 2010, we were invited to be a part of Diane von Furstenberg's production at the Life Ball in Vienna, Austria. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, the Life Ball is Europe's biggest charity event fundraising for uh, people with HIV and AIDS. 
And it is a huge celebration. Every year there's a different theme and a different either designer or celebrity host. And so this particular year, Diane von Furstenberg had been invited to produce something and she was doing sort of like a special New York City presentation. And she thought, what's more New York than the Rockettes? Mm -hmm. So we got to accompany her to Vienna and (laughs) the the sad, now in retrospect, I guess it's funny, um, the thing is we did all of this preparation we got to experience everything. And the night of the performance, it rained and the stage was made out of steel and there was lightning. So we did not actually get to perform. However, that whole experience was just so incredible to be a part of something so beautiful and so celebrated and to be thought of from a designer as big as DVF is is something that really stands out to me. Another one that really stands out to me is when we had our 75th celebration and I got to stand on the red carpet and meet those who were arriving. And one of the invited guests was Tony Bennett, which was pretty incredible. Um, Back in the day, he used to do the voiceover for our big finale. There was a little audio moment at the beginning and he narrated it. So he was there to support. And I got to take pictures with Tony Bennett on the red carpet, which is something I couldn't dream of doing. And I think one of the kind of funnier things to think about is that the Rockettes have been a part of America for such a long time that when you're in costume, you sort of forget that you're not yourself. You're representing this whole iconic legacy. And some of the people who you admire so much actually approach you and ask for photographs. Um, I remember we were waiting in a green room and... Paris Hilton had just done an interview and was leaving the office space. And two minutes later, her person came back and asked if we would be okay with taking a photo with her. And that to me is just so amazing when I think I'm just this dancer who grew up in a small town in Canada and someone as big as Paris Hilton is asking to take pictures with us. That's pretty amazing. That is super amazing. Looking back on your 20-year career, and congratulations, by the way. Thank you so much. I can't believe 20 years has gone by already. And what a fabulous way to spend it. But looking back on your 20-year career as a Rockette, what are some valuable lessons you have learned that have stayed with you throughout your journey and influenced your dance and acro? You know, something that has stood out to me now that I'm more involved with teaching, as someone who's in a room with other dancers or other acrobats, is that there's so much to be learned from observation. So in a class, when you're not dancing the combo or you're not on the mat performing the acro tricks, if you're off on the sides and you're watching your peers do it and you're dissecting the things that you like or the things that you think, maybe if I tried it a different way in this section, I might be better off. You know, if you're being involved in the room, even when you're not physically dancing or performing skills, you are getting twice the benefit of that class and you will benefit from it in the long run. So the power and importance of observation and and the attention to detail, that's what's gonna make you stand out in a room where there are tons of other very similar individuals. That's what I try to bring to my classes when I am teaching because I'm starting to do a lot more uh, work with others as opposed to just on myself and trying to bring this to the attention of the students, how to take class, how to get the most out of every class, trying to give the knowledge that I have spent the last 20 years building to this new generation. Speaking of teaching, how do you think your approach to teaching and coaching has evolved over the years, especially when it comes to integrating acro and maybe even the strength and flexibility conditioning? Um, My teaching has definitely been shaped by the many different leaders I've had the privilege of working under. I've definitely recognized ways that I enjoy receiving information and certain ways that I find more tedious. And I think biggest takeaway that I have been able to come to come out of these uh, experiences with is that 
the ability to communicate in a variety of ways is going to be so helpful to you in your classes. So even though you might be saying the same thing, point your toes, point your toes, point your toes. <laughs> if you can find a way to say things differently, like three, four, five different ways of explaining something, using counts, using words, using imagery, using simile and metaphor, finding ways to inspire the movement so that the student you're teaching can relate to it is so important. We all know that people learn in a variety of ways. And so it can be really difficult in a classroom to find a teaching style that works for everyone. And so I think I have tried to develop a very well-rounded way of communicating, just instinctively giving more and more variety of instruction to get to the same end point so that the students are able to use what works for them. Now, that being said, that only works for amateurs because once you become a professional, the front of the room is not going to tailor their teaching style to the dancers or acrobats in the room. You have to be able to learn from whoever is teaching. But while we're shaping those younger students and those amateurs, finding a way to communicate with them in a manner that they can relate to is going to help them so much more than just constantly repeating the same information. With respect to conditioning, I personally think that my early involvement in gymnastics gave me the discipline and appreciation for conditioning that um, I've always viewed it as something that, you know, it comes from a place of strength and empowerment. And I feel like a lot of times when we start talking about conditioning, there's just this undertone of it being a punishment. And to me, I present it as a way of like, this is something we should be excited about. When we're conditioning, it's our body showing up for us. We are building strength, which is giving us more power. And I love the joy and the feeling of accomplishment that I received from physical activity. So I want to spread that to my students and clients so that they don't look upon conditioning as a chore or a form of punishment, but rather as something that they are being allowed to do and they are given the opportunity to do. I absolutely love all of that. Great insights for teachers everywhere, really, that are teaching in, in all genres. So thank you for that. What advice do you have for dancers and acro dancers who are looking to improve their skills and prevent injuries through proper conditioning? I will always advocate for mastering the basics. And whether it's ballet, jazz, tap, or acro, I think there can be such a tendency to either disregard or rush over the fundamentals when we're just trying to get to the harder skills. But the basics are the fundamentals for a reason. I believe that when you pay attention to the basics and really master those fundamentals, that's where you create that injury prevention where your muscle memory knows the correct pathways so that when you do ask your body to do things with a little bit more power or at a quicker tempo, if something goes awry, you won't, that chain won't break down entirely because you will always know what the foundation is. Well said, Karen. Let's look ahead. What upcoming projects or events are you most excited about working on with acrobatic arts this year? I always love the summer months because that's when I'm able to travel and get on the road with acrobatic arts to deliver the courses to the teachers in the field. So I love June, July, August, where I get to provide the training at the courses for module one and module two. I get to meet the instructors and see their students. And it's actually very beneficial for me as well as I, you know, grow my teaching uh, history to see how people who have been doing it for years and years approach their students and approach their training. It's it's really beneficial. And to me, I am all about community. So I love building these relationships and getting to meet the clients and the different teachers across country. 
And finally, Karen, as someone who has achieved so much already in the world of dance and acro, what's next? I feel like I am most excited currently about a new project that is very close to me. Uh, my husband has just opened an aerial school here in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I cannot wait to see it grow and flourish under his direction. But selfishly, I am also pretty excited to see how I might be able to add to this program uh, with my background in dance and acrobatics and maybe be able to produce some mighty little aerial company. I think I'm just really excited to foster those connections within my community and to share my knowledge of the industry. I think my husband and I have basically experienced nearly everything of what the performing arts and entertainment world, the career side of it um, that you can do. So we have quite a bit of background and experience and we're just ready to start sharing that. So this year is, is a big one. Amazing, Karen. I wish you and your husband all the best with your new business. It sounds super exciting. And you know that this interview has been on my wish list for a long time. So I'm so glad that I finally had the opportunity. Your journey and insights are truly inspiring. I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Lauren. It is always so much fun getting to chat with you. Thanks for joining us on this fantastic journey with the one and only Karen Ritchie. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to kick up those reviews and tap dance your way to subscribing. We'll be back with more high energy, audience approved content. Until next time, keep dancing through life with style and sass. Thanks for listening, everyone, and have a great day.